Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest podcast. This is going to be on the evaluation of the suspected renal mass. We're going to look at key differential points, some of the things we need to figure out when we're looking at a suspected renal tumor, what the urologist wants to know, what the oncologist wants to know, and what the radiologist needs to know. So let's get started. Renal cell carcinoma, there are a number of different factoids I'd like to go through. Uh, it's important to remember that renal cell is one of the most common tumors we're going to see in our practice. Renal cell also is a very, very important tumor in that if we detect it early, surgical resection can cure the patient. If we detect it late, metastases are not uncommon. There's over 200,000 new cases of renal cell carcinoma each year in the United States. A clear cell accounts for about 80% of these tumors, followed by papillary, which is about 15%, and chromophobe renal cell, which is about 5% of the cases. We're going to focus a lot on clear cell, but we're also going to speak about papillary and chromophobe. Clear cell are the ones most likely to metastasize. They're the ones that are most aggressive. We'll also touch a little bit on oncocytomas. We'll also end up speaking about things that could look like renal cell carcinoma, including lymphoma and metastatic disease. So just some numbers. If you look at cancers in general, this is the SEER data. Kidney and renal pelvis, 79,000 new cases with about 13,900 deaths. It represents 4.1% of all new cancer cases in the United States. Five-year survival is good relatively speaking, 76.5%. The percent of survival is very much dependent on where disease is. As I mentioned, early detection confined to the primary site. Those are the cases that are going to do best. Obviously, when cancer has metastasized, those are the patients who are going to have the biggest challenge for survival. And as we all know, metastasis include the lungs, the pancreas, the liver, bone, and brain, just to name a few. Now, when you think about renal cell carcinoma, hematuria is the most common individual presentation. Flank pain is going to be second, but you can see there are a lot of symptoms that are not very specific. Also, it ends up that the majority of renal cell carcinomas, when you look at statistically, are going to be incidental findings. Now, one of the key things, of course, is hematuria which is not an uncommon presentation in the ER or in the doctor's office or anywhere, but there's a big difference between microscopic hematuria and macroscopic hematuria. In patients with microscopic hematuria, tumors are uncommon, and in the largest study, upper tract uh, TCC was found in 0.2%, .2%, renal cell in 1%, and bladder cancer in about 3.7%. In patients, however, with macroscopic hematuria, the risk for malignancy is much higher and can be found in almost 30% of cases overall and in up to 10% of cases, even in patients who are under 40 years of age. So the importance about hematuria when you get the requisition from the ER or from the doctor's office really is this microscopic or is it macroscopic? Microscopic patients are younger, it's just not going to be a tumor. If it's macroscopic, even a young patient could potentially have a tumor. In this article by Ramon and myself, we spoke about this, and because tumors are less likely in younger patients, you can be a little bit more careful in terms of the protocols we use. Uh, we acquire non-contrast arterial and delayed phase imaging, not venous phase. However, of course, in an older patient, you are going to do four-phase acquisition. Key things in terms of renal cell are treatment. Classic nephrectomy is used less and less. Partial nephrectomy is used more and more. Of course, partial nephrectomy really depends on early detection of disease, which we are doing better and better. Obviously, other therapies percutaneously, RF ablation, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and vaccine therapy are all being used. In terms of partial nephrectomy in the beginning, size was very critical. It was under 4 cm, then it became 7 cm, and in reality now, everyone has 
a chance of getting a partial nephrectomy unless there's a reason not to, which would really uh, mean that there's central extension or vascular involvement where a partial nephrectomy is not going to be successful. Because location is so important, we'll use a lot of 3D imaging, and all of this is very important in terms of how we do our protocols. In this article, the AUA guidelines for performing partial nephrectomy include partial nephrectomy should be a priority for management of CT1A renal masses when intervention is indicated. Nephron sparing approaches should be a priority for patients with an anatomical functioning solitary kidney, bilateral tumors, known familiar RCC, pre-existing chronic kidney disease or proteinuria, and that nephron sparing approaches should be considered to patients who are young, have multifocal masses, or have comorbidities that are likely to affect renal function in the future. So the bigger the danger to the patient of having multiple tumors eventually, the more important even borderline partial nephrectomy comes. The AUA guidelines for performing um, a radical nephrectomy stipulates that physicians should consider radical nephrectomy in cases where tumor size and or imaging characteristics suggest increased oncologic potential. And again, it's very important to realize what the AUA was saying in their guidelines and in some of the newer guidelines coming out is that the goal is to do a partial nephrectomy and radical nephrectomy is only when you have to do it. In the past, radical nephrectomies were very common. Now partial nephrectomies are much more common. So for the radiologist, what's our job? Optimize lesion detection. Everything, no matter what organ system you look at, is detection. If you don't detect the lesion, you're not going to classify it. And then you've got to classify it. Most tumors are going to be benign, high-density renal cysts, small angiomyolipomas, uh, complex high-density cysts. We need to optimize the data presentation for the referring physician so we can help with patient management as well. As we said, most renal masses are detected incidentally, and the smaller the mass, the more common it is picked up incidentally. One of the challenges in this article by Dyer, which is 15 years ago, but still makes the point very well, we're getting better and better at detection, but our ability to classify lesions simply has not kept up. In this article from 2003, 25% of renal masses smaller than C3 centimeters were benign, but were resected. So basically, 25% of patients had surgery that wasn't necessary. I don't think the numbers are 25% now, but they're still typically quoted in the 15 to 20% range, that many renal lesions that don't need to be removed are in fact being removed. When you speak about smaller tumors, they tend to be more challenging. They could be renal cells, sure. Could be oncocytomas, could be angiomyolipomas, typically going to be fat, poor AMLs, and of course, complex renal cysts are possibilities. This is going back a ways to, to the white paper initially on renal masses. The comments, large, greater than 3 cm, solid renal masses are largely likely to be malignant. The smaller the mass, the more likely it is to be benign. Therefore, we suggest that solid masses under 1 cm be observed. So one of the things that we have found is smaller tumors, particularly when patients are older, can be followed. We follow many patients at Hopkins. These tumors are often slow growing, have low malignant potential. If they start to grow, then you could do a partial nephrectomy. So we see more and more urologists being very conservative, particularly for high risk patients. Now, when we look at the kidneys, it's really a multi-phase acquisition. Each phase can give us certain bits of information and putting all the phases together is ideal. And so let's look at what the various phases can give us. Well, non-contrast CT. Now we speak about non-contrast CT and some of the challenges that non-contrast CT, uh, you can't say a lesion is benign in a lot of the cases. Non-contrast CT is often ordered for stone disease, but the fact you don't see a stone does not mean the patient's kidneys are normal. And we've spoken about that, especially in the ER setting. When you look at the attenuation of a homogeneous renal mass, 
if it's greater than 70 Hounsfield units, then it's a 99.9% .9 chance it's a high density renal cyst. So that's very important. A lot of the tumors that are resected were in single phase acquisitions where an incidental renal mass was seen and it measured 87 Hounsfield units and it was called a tumor. Yet if you would have had a non-contrast scan, it also measured 87 and was simply a high density renal cyst. So an example in this case, it's about 70 Hounsfield units and when you look at it with contrast, it's still 70 Hounsfield units, almost, 68. But if you only had this arterial phase, you would say it's a solid mass that's relatively hypovascular, probably a papillary renal cell carcinoma, while it really didn't change from non-contrast to arterial. And even on delayed, it's still measuring 69, so it never changed. Again, if you only had delayed, you would say it's a hypovascular tumor in all likelihood, again, focusing on papillary. This teaches us a very important lesson. When a lesion stays the same across phases, it's a high-density renal cyst. So if you only have two phases, but it stays the same, you have to be suspicious it's a high-density renal cyst, and it's not going to be a tumor. Here's another example, well-defined 86 Hounsfield units. That's a high-density renal cyst. The challenge would have been if you had this arterial phase, you would have said, oh, it's 94. Things can enhance a little bit just by beam hardening up to 10 Hounsfield units, but you would be talking about renal cell. And if you look at the same patient, there was 82 on delayed. So really, it doesn't change. It was a high-density renal cyst. It's a leave-alone lesion. But you can see the challenge for us in terms of clinical practice. Especially problematic are the incidental masses, right? If you were looking for a patient with hematuria, you would get multiple phases and recognize what was going on. But if you're only picking up an incidental finding on a trauma patient in the ER or a patient with abdominal pain, rule out pancreatitis, you could see why it's going to be more problematic. In this article by Pooler, all proven renal cells in the series they had contained substantial non-calcified reasons that measured 20 to 70 Hounsfield units. So when things measure 20 to 70, that's your danger zone. The average renal cell carcinoma on non-contrast scans was 37 Hounsfield units. So when you measure on non-contrast under 20 or over 70, and it's well-defined, it's likely going to be benign. Again, this article, 39 Hounsfield units was the average for renal tumors. So that's the danger zone. So if you think about it and you draw a chart, under 20, it's a simple renal cyst. Over 70, it's a high-density renal cyst. And between 20 and 70 is your danger zone where you need to do multi-phase acquisition, recognizing that that's where the malignancies are going to be with that 37 or 39 being the number for renal cell carcinoma. Corwin made the point, an incidental renal mass is considered to be a benign cyst if it's both homogeneous and less than 20 Hounsfield units and it's considered indeterminate if it measures above 20 on either unenhanced or contrast-enhanced CT. So a very important thing to understand. Now, sometimes these lesions are subtle, and one of the reasons non-contrast are challenging is this. If you look at this case, you can quickly walk by it, but if you look hard, there's something going on right here in the mid-portion of the right kidney. You can see it again on the coronal views. It's higher density, but if you measured it, it's not over 70. You can see it stand out nicely on the cinematic rendering. When you give IV contrast, you can see the lesion now enhances. It's not very vascular, but it indeed is vascular. You can see it here on the 3D volume rendering as well. And you can see it on the excretory phase and late venous phase where the mass is well-defined, it's irregular, it's solid, and most consistent with a renal cell carcinoma. Again, this case shows you the danger of how easy it is to miss a lesion on the non-contrast scans. And again, cinematic rendering may be valuable in the future as a way of not missing those subtle lesions, and it's something we are looking at. And another example of increased density, left kidney, it's higher density, but it's irregular. There's calcification. Once you see calcification, you're not going to just be blowing the lesion off. 
And if you look at the lesion with contrast, it enhances and it's a renal cell carcinoma. So very, very important. Not every higher density lesion is going to be benign. Again, it needs to be smooth and homogeneous. If it's a regular or it has a regular calcification, you need to be concerned you're dealing with a renal cell carcinoma. Now, another challenging tumor are angiomyolipomas. Most of the time, they're very easy. Angiomyolipomas, there's no premalignant potential. The challenge is they can bleed, and typically when lesions are over five centimeters, some people say seven, some people say four, they'll typically be resected because of this danger. Most renal angiomyolipomas are incidental findings in 40-year-old females. You can see multiple and larger lesions in patients who have tuberous sclerosis. Most of the time, it's an easy diagnosis. There's a variable amount of fat. You can see a lot of fat in this lesion on the left. The lesion is then vascular. Here's another vascular mass on the right. There's no confusion. Yes, renal cell carcinomas can have a little bit of fat, but when the lesion is a fatty tumor like this, it's an angiomyolipoma, very nicely seen. Septations are common. Areas of irregular vascularity are common. The more vascular a lesion, the more likely it is to bleed, and the more likely it will be resected. They can be very large, nearly replacing the entire kidney in this case. And when they get very large, at times it can be confusing with a retroperitoneal liposarcoma. But here you can tell it's really arising from the kidney, prominent vessels, and this surely is going to be resected. Here's a patient with tuberous sclerosis. They get bilateral AMLs. The kidneys are very large, and most of the kidney is replaced by a range of appearances of angiomyolipomas. Just very impressive renal size and very impressive fatty involvement. Fatrich AMLs are defined as a lesion measuring less than 10 Hounsfield units. Most of them probably measure closer to minus 50 to minus 80 Hounsfield units. Almost all fat-rich AMLs are easily diagnosed on a non-contrast scan. Approximately 5% of renal AMLs have a small amount of fat, and these can be more challenging. Often you will see small angiomyolipomas or angiomyolipomas with minimal fat resected because no one recognizes the fat that's present. They look at it, see a lower density zone. You need to be very careful. So in this case, there's a little dot in a mass in the left kidney, but you could just ignore it perhaps and say, this is a solid mass, probably a papillary renal cell. Let's resect it. But if you put a dot over that little area and look harder, there are other dots and they're all measuring like minus 70 Hounsfield units. This is an excellent example of a lipid-poor angiomyolipoma, which can be left alone because there's so little fat, it's unlikely this lesion will ever bleed. Same thing on the right side. looks like an incidental one centimeter lesion. Could it be a renal cell? Now, one of the reasons people say under 1 cm leave alone is a case like this. If you look carefully, it looks vascular and it's a renal cell. But if you look more closely, there's a little dot in the lesion. And if you measured that dot, it measured negative. And this was a small angiomyolipoma, a leave-alone lesion measuring minus 63. You need to be very careful. Sometimes you don't appreciate the fat on the axials, and it's a bit easier to see on the coronals. So make sure you're always looking at the coronal imaging. Now, I've showed you a little bit about some of the phases. We've discussed a little bit about high-density renal cysts and how they can be confusing on specific phases. One of the key things on renal imaging is thinking about the kidney as functional imaging, with the kidney looking different depending on the phase of acquisition and the phase of acquisition really defining our accuracy. So let's do this. Let's take a short break and let's come back and discuss functional CT imaging of the kidneys. See you in a few minutes. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more.
We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.